The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome to the Women in Depth podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Join me as we explore the inner lives of women, their struggles, fears, hopes, and dreams. We'll go beneath the surface and take a deeper look at what is hidden, unknown, uncertain, and uncomfortable. Hi, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, my guest is Michael Gellert. Michael is a union analyst practicing in Los Angeles and Pasadena. He sees individuals and couples and offers a union writing workshop. He was formerly director of training at the C.G. Jung Institute of Los Angeles and a humanities professor at Vanier College in Montreal. He managed an employee assistance program for the city of New York and has been a mental health consultant for the University of Southern California and Time Magazine. Michael was educated in Rabbinic Judaism, studied theology at Loyola College, Montreal, and trained with the renowned Zen master Kun Yamada in Japan for two years. His books include Modern Mysticism, The Way of the Small, which received the Center for Spirituality and Practices Book Award for one of the best spiritual books of 2007, And I just have to add, it's one of my favorite books, and most recently, The Divine Mind, Exploring the Psychological History of God's Inner Journey. And Michael was with us on a previous episode to discuss that book as well. He is also the author of The Fate of America, for which he received a letter of appreciation from Bill Clinton, and which was given to Barack Obama by one of his advisors. A revised edition of this book, with a discussion of the Trump phenomenon, was published last year under the title, America's Identity Crisis, The Death and Rebirth of the American Vision. Just last month, The Divine Mind and America's Identity Crisis each received a Nautilus Book Award under separate categories. Hi, Michael, and welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to dig into this very rich and powerful book. As I was reading it, there were so many times when I just had to put it down and really just try to comprehend and sit with what you shared. So thank you so much for writing this. I feel like it's helpful for me and at least with those who I've shared it with in kind of just locating ourselves collectively and individually in our time, if that makes sense. Well, thank you very much for your good words. <laughs> I appreciate it. The book uh, does really focus on what you're talking about, really situating ourselves in history, where we're at and uh, what is being called upon from us. So your emphasis on locating fits in very well there. When I think of location, I think of the metaphors of like a compass, using a compass or a or a map, and how when you're able to kind of orient yourself things are not as difficult or challenging. And so you have brought me, um, helped me to experience a little bit more sense of uh, peace right now. (laughs) So thank you. Good. (laughs) We could could use as much of that as we could get. (laughs) Yes. So in your introduction, you include a quote by Heraclitus, character is fate. And your book is a study of how national character relates or tells us about the nation's problems and the nation itself. And so I wanted to start off with talking about what is America's national character and what does that reveal about the challenges that we face as a nation? Well, the first thing that should be said is that the American national character or national identity is composed of many, many different parts, largely because we're an immigrant nation. So you find uh, all kinds of threads coming together in the overall fiber or rope that defines the American character. The main quality, though, which cuts across all the different minorities in the country and unites everybody under a single ideal is the heroic ideal. And that's a term I 
borrowed from Jung when he was asked on a visit to America what was the main feature he observed about America. He said it is its heroic ideal, by which he meant its aspiration toward greatness. And uh, we could add here also its founding vision by the founding fathers and uh, before them the Puritans. So the American vision champions the idea of an ethical nation with an enlightened citizenry where all individuals strive to be the best that they could. And that really goes back to the founders, George Washington, John Adams, particularly uh, Thomas Jefferson, the idea of an enlightened citizenry or a nation that's united by an obligation to its citizens, but reversed as well, the obligation of the citizens to the nation. So it's a very different model than we've sort of uh, fallen into today. And the most recent version of that that comes to mind is what uh, John Kennedy famously said, ask not what your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country. So you see, that's uh, something at the heart of the founding vision. And uh, what defines a hero from the point of view of the founders is somebody who strives for this kind of contribution rather than serving themselves. It's a different model. That's powerful. You know, to, so it's really, there's been a, a shift about what this heroic ideal means for the people, what means for our country. There has been a, a deterioration of that heroic ideal. It, it uh, was very strong in its uh, initial decades after the American Revolution. And then a number of things conspired together to create what you've described correctly as a shift. One of that, those was that the other aspect of American national character is the heroic ideal uh, of an enemy-oriented heroic ideal. That's a natural kind of posture every nation has, which is to defeat its enemies or to protect the nation from invasion by enemies. So there's a place for that. There's two kinds of heroism that we can observe in America, the enemy-oriented heroism, which I just described, and the citizen-oriented heroism, which is the one of the founding fathers. And both have often been there together in the course of American history. It's not, not a question of one or the other. It's a question of the right balance between the two. But what has happened as history has uh, brought us into modern times is that we've lost touch with the original heroic founding vision of the founding fathers. And what remains is a predominant enemy-oriented heroism. So as I was reading, you know, Michael, one of the lines that stood out for me was, quote, the particular heroes of a nation tell us who that nation wishes to be. They tell us about that nation's sense of its fate, about its maturity and mastery of that fate. And I found this to be very compelling because it really made me think about, you know, who are our heroes now and what does that say about our sense of fate and our maturity? And of course, I know that this is a question that can be asked at any time in our historical timeline. So I would love if you could just share a little bit more about this. Sure. Well, the original heroes of the nation, once it was founded, was, uh, of course, the founding fathers, whose names I mentioned. Washington was a great hero. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the f subsequent presidents, became heroic figures. And, of course, as we move um Along to the next century after the revolution, when we had the Civil War, there was a huge question of what is heroism in our country? In fact, you could look at the Civil War and you could see it as a clash between two different kinds of heroic ideals. The South had an enemy-oriented heroic ideal, almost exclusively in the sense that to turn an entire population of African slaves into agents for maintaining the plantation economy, to look at people as if they're objects in that way is a kind of enemy-oriented heroism. 
we see other forms of that enemy-oriented heroism coming after the founding fathers. There were the explorers who went into the continent that had not been discovered fully yet, and uh, they mapped out and paved the way for the territories to then become developed. They looked at the environment as a kind of enemy that needed to be conquered. And of course, the Native Americans became enemies. And no matter how much they compromised by accepting to be put on reservations, in the end, they lost their land again and again because the white man would revise the agreement. We see that with Andrew Jackson. He found an excuse to uh, relocate the Cherokees and a number of the other nations. And uh, we had the famous Trail of Tears, where tens of thousands of Indians perished just in being relocated in the middle of the winter from the South to other states. America has not had, Lourdes, a single decade in its history without war. Whether a declared war or an incursion, this country is very much built on that kind of machismo ideal. And there are positive aspects to the heroic ideal that's uh, the enemy-oriented one as well. After the explorers came the cowboy, and the cowboy then evolved into a kind of athletic figure. So today we have athletes as a predominant hero type. The astronauts, who were also conquering space, they became heroes. So you see, it's a very important aspect of the American heroic ideal. And certainly it needs to be emphasized that there are many occasions when the enemy-oriented heroic ideal is appropriate. In 9-11, a uh, response to quote-unquote our enemies was necessary. Uh, World War II could be looked at in the same way. The Vietnam War was falling upon this old heroic ideal, but in a very complicated situation, and it didn't work out well for America. The problem with the enemy-oriented heroism is that it derives its sense of identity from fighting an enemy. It always requires an enemy, an adversary, and is at a loss without one. So you see, we've really developed in that vein uh, much more than we started out with, because when we started out, we had a balance between the enemy-oriented heroism and the citizen-oriented heroism. But today, we're very one-sided. We're just an enemy-oriented heroism, and you really see this today in uh, Trump's America. Now, if I could just say a little bit, just to contrast that with a little more clearly with the citizen-oriented heroism, rather than revolving around the enemy and defining oneself by the war one engages with one's enemy, citizen-oriented heroism revolves around the citizen's responsibility to society and to other citizens. It sees the hero as a healer rather than a warrior and a partner rather than a dominator. It sees the hero as a collaborator, not so much as a competitor, a communicator rather than a conqueror and uh, an explorer in the deeper inner sense rather than an exploiter of other peoples, either on our, our own uh, soil or in other foreign countries. So the enemy-oriented heroism doesn't go down to those deep values that are part of our depth, you know, the depth of character and the, the depth as in depth psychology. The citizen-oriented hero is somebody who is strong but empathic, and able to extend not only an iron fist, but an open helping hand. It's more connected to the feminine side of the psyche, one of relatedness and relationship, whereas the enemy-oriented heroism tends to be more or less built on the old-fashioned traditional masculine virtues. So you see, the, the citizen-oriented heroism, the hero learns how to live with his or her aggressive instincts and drives, while knowing how to be tender and nurturing. It's a completely different mindset or paradigm. There's a lot more complexity to it versus the more black and white, simplistic perspectives from the enemy-oriented perspective when it's not in its, uh, you know, when it's being expressed in a 
unhealthy, unhelpful way. Because I, I like too how you um, you did say that there is a time and a place for an enemy oriented perspective, but also what happens is we have gone too much to one side, and and that's where we find ourselves in this current experience. That's right. And you're uh, pointing out the complexity that the citizen-oriented heroism has compared to the enemy-oriented heroism. It's a much more complex texture. And, uh, you know, today we live in very complex times and we live in an era of globalization. So the enemy-oriented heroism uh, only gets you so far with that, whereas the citizen-oriented heroism that sees all the citizens in the world as fellow citizens is much more collaborative and suited to respond to the complexity of the interdependence of all nations when we don't champion those values of being related as one global community, what you get is a breakdown of that and a kind of nationalist holds kind of uh, enemy-oriented heroism return. And that's what we're seeing today. Trump is not oriented toward globalization and he doesn't have a keen awareness of how the nations are uh, interdependent. And when that breaks down, America loses its connection to its very vision because we have to remember that what the citizen-oriented heroism of figures like uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams and James Madison and all the others, what they were advocating was a kind of, to use Jefferson's words, a brotherhood of man. We can take the gender today and just call it a brotherhood of humanity. The world really needs that today, particularly with problems like global warming and climate change and the pollution of the air and our oceans from our you know, emission of C2, carbon dioxide emissions. This needs to be a global effort. China and India are huge contributors to climate change just as much as America, and they're soon going to overtake America in that because of their large populations. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with what we need to master in the next decades in order to prevent our planet from becoming inhabitable? Well, it needs this kind of uh, citizen-oriented heroism that the Founding Fathers championed. Yeah, it makes me think about that, you know, going back to just the term, you know, enemy oriented, you know, if, if the enemy's over there, and we're not the enemy, so there's no, you know, inner reflection, self reflection, looking at oneself, there's this idea that that's not my problem. We don't need you. This is a total disconnect from the reality that this is a human experience that we're having, that there are others, there are so many different things at stake for not just our country, but our planet. It really keeps you separate when you um, look at things from that enemy-oriented heroism. It's, all, it's just a kind of pointing the finger across the table. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's focused on the other. Yeah, yeah. The uh, citizen-oriented heroism focuses on ourselves in a reflective kind of way. You know, that old um, statistic that's been with us now for the last uh, 20 years that America constitutes 5% of the world's population but consumes 25% of its natural resources. Well, this is a disparity that, uh, you know, can never exist if uh, citizen oriented heroism were more than merely the abstract ideal it's become in modern times. Unless we examine ourselves and own our role to that disparity and are willing to work on it, the situation globally will not change. And as the scientists are are warning us now, we don't have too much time left because if we reach a tipping point where the ecological system that unites the entire planet, you know how they show that the Amazon jungle, the oxygen it releases into the atmosphere, which is necessary for fresh air, (laughs) if they continue to develop the jungle and the area becomes a a desert, which they're afraid could happen, we're all in for huge problems. It's the collapse of not only the world ecology, but possibly of civilization itself. This really requires a different set of values and a different approach. 
Michael, the two principles most active in the American national character, which you write about, are the spirits or principles of youth and authority. Could you share a little bit more about that? Sure. We have two spirits in our breast. We're beings who are riddled by dualities, enemy-oriented and citizen-oriented heroes, and are just one pair of the opposites that particularly riddle the American psyche. The other one that is a strong polarity is, as you pointed out, the spirit of youth and the spirit of authority. And I use spirit here not in a um, magical sense, but simply in the sense of the orientation that we have. And the two orientations, the youth orientation, is typical for younger countries that are building themselves up. They tend to want to become empires or to explore ways to have domination over other countries. It's the kind of spirit of expansionism, of conquest. It's very closely aligned with uh, enemy-oriented heroism. Now, America, as a younger nation, has very much this youth orientation, and it's a very healthy thing. It's responsible for the robust quality of Americans, their can-do mentality, their commitment to leading the world in so many different ways, industrially, economically, but also in, in terms of conscience. When America's on the right side of history, the rest of the world looks up to her as a, a leader and a guide. The older nations, however, are predominantly shaped by the spirit of authority. And that's the spirit of wisdom, of becoming an authority that other nations look to. It's the other side of the youth orientation, and it's what youth evolves into. You could think of countries like China, India, England, France. These are countries that have been around for millennia now, and they have a certain wisdom about setting limits and priorities. England today is no longer an empire and doesn't strive to be one, but it is still with its wealth of experience and leadership and uh, its civility is looked upon by much of the rest of Europe as a, a leader, which is one reason why the Brexit, in addition to the economic factors, is such a shock now, because it's taking England out of that unity. And that was very much a resurgence of the spirit of youth, this kind of, we can go it alone. Right, right. And this is going on elsewhere in the world, too. We see very much in America. Trump is very much a kind of a spirit of youth and himself has been described now by many pundits as a child whose emotional development is arrested in the traumas of his childhood. What happens is when you get a split between the spirit of youth and the spirit of authority, a split between the two spirits that need to be held together in that breast of ours, you get the worst side of both poles constellating in the culture and the society. And by the way, for those in your audience who are uh, familiar with uh, Jungian psychology and uh, particularly the work of James Hillman, the spirit of youth is basically the uh, puer archetype. And the spirit of authority is the wise old man or wise old woman or senex archetype. Senex is root in the word senator or senescence. In its negative aspect, it's senility. Puer, the child uh, or youth principle, is also the root of the word purility mm. uh, or puerile, immature and childish. These are not two opposite separated forces. They're actually aspects on the same continuum of human development as youth leads into authority by aging and becoming wise. Reversely, a society that gets too uh, conservative or too stuck in its old ways and needs to be revivified, needs to be rejuvenated, needs the spirit of youth to come in and give it a breath of fresh air. You see that China has a wonderful ability as a nation who founded on the spirit of authority it has a wonderful ability to reinvent itself. Mm -hmm. And great China miracle we see today is really um, 
due to the talent the nation has for revisioning its direction. So you see, we need a similar kind of revisioning of our own direction today in America. And, you know, there's a saying in French that we back up in order to leap forward. We need to back up to our roots, which had an integration. The founders had an integration of the two spirits. And these spirits became dissociated from each other as the decades after the revolution came. Uh, You found uh, very much the uh, Civil War was a war between the spirit of authority, which in that instance was captured by the North, by the Union, and the spirit of youth was captured by the South. The North or the Union captured the spirit of authority because it rested on principles that we see were on the right side of history. It wanted to advocate a society of equality. And that's a kind of virtue that comes with uh, a seasoned national experience. The South, by contrast, was the spirit of youth insofar as it was the rebels. They were the rebels. And they wanted to break away from uh, unity with the rest of the country and make their own nation. So there was an incentive there for something new. That's the thing about the spirit of youth. It is predominantly characterized by a fascination with novelty. And in America's identity crisis, I have a whole section called the cult of novelty, to uh, forever be young, to forever be new. So these two sides were actually also having their own war within the Civil War, the spirit of youth and the spirit of authority. And in that instance, the spirit of authority came out as the winner. And you see this reemerging again and again. In this, we saw it in the civil rights movement. Wherever there is a return to fundamental values, but in a tolerant democratic way, you see the spirit of authority. So both spirits have a positive side and a negative side, and it's the negative of both that gets constellated when there's a split. We saw that, for example, in the McCarthy era. There, the spirit of authority was on the dark side because McCarthy was using his authority as a senator and as the uh, leader of the trend of the day, which was they passed an act, I believe it was called the Un-American Affairs Act, where they would identify everybody who was not a good American, either they were communists or sympathizers, and it created a paranoia in the culture. It brought out a tendency that is there when somebody gets very ultra-conservative or ultra-orthodox, they get dogmatic and rigid. That's the dark side of authority. The positive side is its vision for a democratized, enlightened citizenry. These are all values that go back to ancient Rome, or not the Roman Empire, but the Roman Republic at at its height. And it goes back to the height of Greek civilization as well. With youth, there's the negative side, which tends to get us into wars and keeps us forever young, forever innocent, forever blind to our own shadow. And the positive side of youth is its ability to revivify or rejuvenate. We need the positive side of youth today, and we need the positive side of authority today, because in the last couple of years, we really see that the negative aspects of both have been constellated. I like how you said earlier, too, that if we are one-sided too long, then it's the negative aspect that's going to be what is showing up. Yeah, that's basically a principle that uh, Jung borrowed from Heraclitus, to mention him again. Heraclitus was very interested in... uh, the polarity versus the harmony that could be created among polar opposites. If you got your yin and yang integrated the way the Tao, the image of the Tao, you know, the circle with the two halves, and then in in each half is a little circle, which is the other half. (laughs) So in the middle of the yang is a yin, and in the middle of the yin is a yang. Well, it's the same with youth and authority, and with uh, enemy-oriented and citizen-oriented heroism. You need to stay connected to the other to remain balanced and connected, because again, all these opposites fall each on their own continuum. And if you get lopsided, 
what happens is you bring out the worst of the two or they split apart and you actually get a civil war or a, a breakdown in civility, which is what we see today. Yeah. In every item in the news is like that. The, the police shootings, the demonstrations that come in response to them, the whole immigration, raising the immigration issue to an enemy-oriented political position. You make the other absolutely other and then they lose their humanity in your eyes, and that can justify you to do anything to them. Yeah. So uh, this is a serious uh, problem, and, and what Heraclitus, as a Western counterpart to the East Taoism, what Heraclitus was arguing for was a balance between the two. Now, what can also happen, he observed, was uh, what he called an enantiodromia. That's a term Jung used as well. He borrowed it from Heraclitus, which is when you become too extreme in one side of the polarity, what happens at a certain moment, it flips into its opposite. Mm, very interesting. That, again, is a kind of splitting because you just end up flipping back and forth. And what we see in the last 50 years of American history, you could chart it with every single uh, huge shift in the presidential politics. You get the authority principle in an extreme with uh, Nixon. And then after Ford, who didn't last too long as a president, he was only in the office for two years, then came Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter was very much the spirit of youth, but he didn't have a firm command of authority politically. Internally, as a human being, he does, and that makes him a remarkable human being. But he wasn't able to translate that into his politics. Clinton came, and Clinton came very much as the spirit of youth. And then George W. Bush came as the spirit of authority. And with that, we had the incursion into Iraq. We see in the last 50 years a flip-flopping between conservatism and liberalism. And when they get polarized, what happens is you just go back and forth. In the days of the founders, Jefferson himself made this observation that this conservatism, which is the spirit of authority, and liberalism, which is the spirit of youth, have always been part of the American character. Because half the nation is, as human nature is, tends to be conservative, and the other half tends to be liberal. So if you get into a position of turning the other into an enemy, you get gridlock in Congress, and you get this inertia, this, this stuckness. Mm. We need to have figures who can balance both sides and can do it with a certain lightness and even humor. <laughs> and the best of our politicians and leaders have been figures who were able to do that. Clinton had that ability. Truman had that ability. It looks like Joe Biden has that ability. We have to uh, make good choices, as, as uh, the psychologist Sidney Girard once said, uh, choose your hypnotist carefully. <laughs> That's a good one. We need to really listen to what uh, our candidates for the presidency and for the other very important offices in the nation, we need to listen to what they're really telling us because we then vote them into power. We will be under their influence for at least four years and look at what has happened to America's stature in the world just in the last two years. So, Michael, I wanted to touch on another part of your book, which I felt was, you know, very, very compelling and moving. And, and you gave examples of how America's heroic ideal, how it's gone awry, and some examples you gave in the book about specifically the addiction to height and then the addiction to innocence. Well, the addiction to height, uh, and by the way, all these qualities can be observed in the history of other nations. The metaphor of height is observable in the aspiration to go higher and higher. It's the image of Icarus who gets inflated, thinks he's godlike, and he rises very high on his wings of wax till the sun melts them and he comes crashing down. Well, that's the story of every empire in history. The Mongolian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Napoleonic Empire, 
the British Empire, what goes up must come down. It is not a natural condition for humanity that one nation should run the entire world. It's just a situation that cannot endure. Height is also a metaphor we could observe in our culture. Uh, getting high and the search for the experience of ecstasy, which is a genuine part of the religious nature of humankind, gets too extreme or overtakes the other virtues of being a responsible citizen and living in the world and having a, a caretaking uh, response to the earth rather than an exploiting response which poisons the environment. You also see, of course, the spirit of youth taking over a nation in its darkest aspect with uh, the rise of the Third Reich. Germany, unlike, uh, for example, Spain, France, and England, is a young country up until, I believe, the 1700s and even into the 1800s. Germany was not yet a united nation. That pretty much came with uh, Bismarck, who uh, unified the Prussian nation into one whole, and then that became the real beginnings of Germany as a nation. Getting higher and higher is the natural byproduct of a nation under the grip of the spirit of youth. It's no accident that uh, the symbol or image of the eagle is archetypally common to all young nations in the phase of expansion. The American eagle, Saddam Hussein, the black eagle on the flags of Iraq under Saddam's regime, England, France, all of them have, uh, even Native American uh, tribes have had the eagle as a logos for both the nobility of the eagle and its ability to soar high and be a fabulous hunter. Height is uh, a good thing. We, we speak of the height of achievement, the height of morality, the height of creativity. But it, again, it has a dark side, which is you get inflated and you get too big for your britches. And again, all empires sooner or later end. Now, America had a different kind of empire than previous empires. It's not been geographic outside the boundaries of North America, but uh, it's a kind of empire of power, economic power, multinational uh, internationalism is really spearheaded in the world today by America. So it's why people like even like John McCain, when they spoke of the height of make America great again, what, what do they mean? They mean the height of greatness. Even John McCain, however, spoke about a limit to that, because if we're exploiting the other nations of the world, our own stature will come down as well. It will end up being harmful not only to those nations, but to ourselves. When you wrote about the addiction to innocence, you included Bertrand Russell's wording of naive realism being the belief that things are the way that they appear. And I thought that that was a very interesting idea, especially in light of the times that we're living in with the fake news and things not being as they appear, <laughs> you know? That's right. The addiction to innocence has been with America from the beginning. And even the founding fathers had innocent assumptions of history and of what America is or could be. In some ways, uh, with you see this particularly with Jefferson, there's a kind of minimizing of the dark side and a glorification of democracy. Democracy is definitely a, a modern wonder of the world. But um, as uh, Tocqueville showed as early as the 18th century, there's a lot of shadow to democracy as well because freedom – frees up not only your strengths and your talents, but the dark side of us as well. So there needs to be a balance that grounds our innocence in the hard facts of everyday life. Which I think speaks to what we were saying at the beginning of the conversation about this complexity, this willingness to be in the discomfort and to see how all of these different aspects are interacting and bringing them all into the picture. It's not just this 
black or white thinking like children can think very simply in that way. And so now it's this, I, I think there's a need for we as a collective to be willing to look at ourselves, to look at things more deeply, going back to the, you know, the citizenship oriented heroism that somehow our leaders or other people are supposed to be doing certain things to make sure that our country, our lives are a certain way and not seeing again that we have to look inside ourselves for that leader. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, the, the very basis of democracy, as the founders conceived it, was that the participation of the citizen in making the nation a cohesive moral force, that it's not just a top-down kind of arrangement. You elect your leaders and they'll take care of our problems for us. Particularly with the environmental issues, everybody needs to be involved there needs to be programs, of course, that and policies that the government spearheads, but everybody needs to play their role in it. The opposite of innocence is the self-examined life. And that kind of introspection, both on an individual level and a national level, is something that uh, we're at a loss for today. Even in education, they're not emphasizing the humanities as much as the sciences, and our problems need both of those. So one of the things that I highlight in America's identity crisis is this ideal of innocence, and I uh, use the uh, writings of Lewis, uh, the uh, literary critic, to show in all the great American classics, the novels, the problem of innocence that the authors are trying to make the nation aware of. Moby Dick is a wonderful example of that. Uh, Melville was writing that story in part as a metaphor for America and what was happening already in his day, that the country was being innocent or having uh, what's known in the Jungian terminology as a white shadow. <laughs> it's a shadow that you don't see and you present to the world as white, that it doesn't exist. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It means we have two problems. We have the problem of the shadow, which is a human problem. It's natural. And we have the problem of being blind to it or denying it. And that's the real problem. Because if you see your shadow and you can work on it, then that's part of a harmonious relationship with our human nature. We have a dark side that we need to be connected to. When you have a white shadow, you're not connected to it. And then it, as Jung said, what you don't bring forth in your awareness within you comes at you from the outside as a crisis, like, for example, you know, 9-11. We knew already for 10 years what was going on in uh, the Middle East in terms of uh, a growing resentment towards uh, America's presence there and the whole way the oil industry was uh, managed. But then, of course, when 9-11 happens, everybody's in tremendous shock because we're innocent of that side. Many events often landed only on page 20 in the newspaper so they don't get the attention they deserve. Innocence requires a, a kind of sobering up. And uh, we're seeing that today exactly as you said earlier, lured us with uh, you know, the f alternate facts and fake news. We don't know what's real and not real anymore. And all of that is a function of our innocence. And you know, I think too that that experience of like not knowing what's real, that is uh, the impetus for us to take an active role in discerning what is real instead of waiting for us to be told what is real. Right. Again, going back to the individual, going back to the citizen, you know, that what is true for me and how do I know that? You know, what is right and how do I know that? That's right. And the uh, problem with education today from uh, kindergarten all the way right through to graduate school is that there's an emphasis on putting information into us, whether it's uh, computer programming or business administration or scientific innovation. It's uh, a very fact-oriented endeavor. In contrast to a fact-based uh, education, we need an education that's much more 
exploring the ancient virtues, the values of our traditions going all the way back to uh, ancient history. Uh, Greece and Rome and uh, China and India, there's so much to be learned about what would make America great because America has all these assets at its fingertips. We have to remember that the founders, all the founding fathers were deeply steeped in Greek philosophy and Roman ethics, Cicero and uh, so forth. All of them were concerned with the question of what is the good life? So we have an education system that generates people who can make a lot of money and can follow the American dream of prosperity. But nobody asks, what do you want to do with all that prosperity when you get it? What is it for? Mm -hmm. Is it for just going on vacations and going to Las Vegas and gambling? Or is that good for providing opportunities for social development and, and self-development among individuals, among the citizenry. I conclude the book with a long quote from Lyndon Johnson about the great society. And he's clearly talking about the city on the hill, which was a Roman idea of a highly civilized nation. Johnson was advocating that. He, he unfortunately, as I write, got derailed by uh, the Vietnam War, but he uh, passed the Civil Rights Bill and a whole lot of other things that were advancing the nation in its integrity, in its psychological and ethical integrity. So we don't see that anymore today, and we don't hear about that. Everybody's talking about make America great or make America great again, but what do they mean by that? Is it militarily great? Is it uh, commercially great? Is it culturally great? Is it morally great? What, what do we mean by that? Again, stepping into the complexity. Exactly. You know, in your book, you write about how in all the hero myths around the world and the legends, this death rebirth cycle is part of that archetypal experience. What does that mean for us moving forward through this time? And what we as individuals can do with, you know, with this understanding, if, if someone was, you know, was to hear this and this is resonating with them, you know, how do you take all of this? And when you find yourself and locate yourself in, in what is happening right now, how do you move forward? You know, I think we've, 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 we've alluded to it with citizenship oriented heroism, but I, I was wondering is that as we wrap up, you could perhaps add a little bit more to what do we do with this? What are the implications for the individual? Yeah. Good question. It may be in America's interest, an asset in its character, that it is a young nation that is very much aspiring toward greatness and wanting to be a great nation in history. Because the death and rebirth of the hero is a common motif. You see it not only in movies and folklore where the hero gets into a crisis and they fall upon their own self-worth only because the outer world is against them and they have to reinvent themselves. The, the hero is not born as a hero. He becomes a hero by something he does or something he contributes. The fact that America has the heroic ideal as its primary trait in its national character could be a, a very good thing. And we've seen America redefine itself a number of times in its short history. So it has that flexibility and that ability to adapt to the uh, challenges of history. Right now, what we see is a vacillating back and forth between an old heroism, which alone by itself is not working, and grasping at a new heroism. But we don't know where to look for that. We don't look into our own past. We don't look into the past history of other nations. So we don't benefit uh, from them and we end up reinventing history. What's the individual's role in all this? Well, we all have a responsibility, as you said earlier, to really be a neutral observer of what is happening and what's being reported in the media and to participate in all the forums of 
discussion, the public discourse. We see a revivication today actually uh, being initiated by this uh, Trump era because there's a lot more protests going on and there's a lot more discussion about uh, you know, America's commitment to the world. Investigative journalism has once again become animated and doing its job. As journalists themselves, uh, many of them admit, they gave Trump a free ride <laughs> when he was running. And that led to his election when nobody believed that could happen. And now they're making up for it by really examining everything going on in the administration. The individual owes it to themselves and to a society to be an, an observer of what's going on, a student of it, uh, but to also be a participant observer in whatever way we as individuals can contribute. We need to be doing our part, whatever we do for a living, whether we're a homemaker or a dentist or doctor or psychotherapist, whatever, to try to give something back to society rather than just take. You know, I'm not speaking in uh, specific terms of policies because this is not really something that can be mandated and orchestrated from top down. The leaders reflect the population's temperament at any given moment in time just as much as they create it. When we look to our leaders to do everything, well, we're going to get hoodwinked by leaders who promise that they're going to do everything. <laughs> really, we need leaders who give back to us our responsibility. That was one reason why Carter didn't succeed. He was really, it was no fault of his. He was ahead of his time. But I think people now with what's happening are at a point where they hopefully can ask the right questions and tolerate the shadowy feelings and the feelings of resistance doing the hard work that's required. I'll end on this note. Uh, we see now almost every day the news, TV, the first 10 minutes are about all the different climactic cataclysms that are happening, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, fires, more and more people are being affected by this. Uh, when these storms come, 13, 14 states have to declare emergencies. Yet you don't hear much in the news words like climate change, global warming, desertification. You don't hear the newscasters putting their finger on the source of the problem and naming it. You know, there's this innocence shrouding all these climate problems without any question of why are these storms and fires increasing year by year. We don't listen to the scientists. We don't put that on page one in the newspaper rather than as a column at the back. So I think that that kind of education and public discourse is really the beginning. So you see, all these issues are invitations for us to get involved in whichever ones speak to our heart and bring out the citizen in us and bring that into the world and participate because we're all in this together and it's not going to happen in a top-down model, really is as Gandhi said, we need to become the change we wish to see. Yeah, and it, you know, for me too, as you were as you were beautifully wrapping this up, I just thought about um, in the new revised edition of your book, you added the appendix on the Trump phenomenon and paradox, and you started off with a quote from Biden, which he had tweeted. I guess basically he made the statement that for Trump to grow up, and I felt like when you were describe what you were describing right now really was speaking to we as a collective, you know, it's time to grow up, to be responsible, to do our share, to be involved, to think of others, to step out of that childlike egocentricism that it's all about me. I don't like to share. You're wrong. You're, you know, the black and white thinking that children have and, you know, really to begin to embrace this other, the other end of this polarity. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's completely right. The focus is every day in the news is on Trump. Trump did this, Trump did that. We need to focus on ourselves because we're the ones who put him into power. And we're the ones who 
in exercising our democratic rights, make the choices of the direction the nation will go. So it's easy to blame Trump. Trump is not really the source of this decades-long identity crisis we've been having. He's a manifestation of it. And the seeds for it have been planted decades ago and have slowly been growing. And now we see it in full flourish. So hopefully this will wake us up and we can make different choices. Michael, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your deep insights. I'm very grateful for this time. And I know that our conversation will be you know, very meaningful for our listeners. Thank you, Lourdes, for having me on. Take care. You too. Thanks so much for listening to the Women in Depth podcast. I hope it brings you a deeper understanding of yourself and others, and that you found some insights that illuminated and inspired. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting Women in Depth with a one-time or recurring donation. Any amount is appreciated and helps us continue to provide free, quality content for the world. If donating resonates with you, you can find the donation link on today's show notes. You can also follow Women in Depth on Facebook and YouTube, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe on iTunes. Again, thank you so much for listening, and see you next time.